Thank you for joining me for this episode. We're excited to be joined by Dr. Bruce Koffler, and we're going to be speaking about the ophthalmology's perspective on myopia management. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us. Today, we're joined by Dr. Bruce Koffler. We're going to be speaking about uh, ophthalmology and its perspective on myopia management. Uh, Dr. Bruce, it is so awesome to have you here with us on the Myopia Podcast. David, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here, and uh, um, I hope that perhaps there's some uh, learning to come through uh, a voyage through my journey into yeah. uh, so I um, yeah, tell us tell I us could, a little bit about, about your practice. Where do you practice, and tell us a little bit about it. Well, I, I finished my ophthalmology training at Georgetown University in D.C. and did a fellowship in cornea and external disease with uh, a great mentor of mine, Dr. Michael Lemp. And I was fortunate enough to have an excellent uh, fitter in the practice um, for our graft patients. So I got to learn a little bit about contact lenses, and then I if you will, finished my fellowship, made my journey to my first job at the University of Kentucky running the cornea service. After four years, I left the university and started private practice, 1983. I walked out and started private practice. I think I had three or four patients my first day in private practice and was wondering if I would ever, ever make a living. I uh, stuck with it here in Lexington. I never left Lexington. We didn't have any other cornea specialists. In the, in the city. So um, it was a golden opportunity for me. And, and I brought in to my practice a contact lens fitter um, from the region who fits specialty lenses. And that worked out really well for about 10 years or so. And then I brought in uh, my first uh, optometrist, um, Dr. Vivian Smith, and we became a little bit of a referral center for other patients for keratoconus, for grass, for irregular corneas of all kinds. In around uh, the 90s, I developed a lens called the Quintosphere, developed a team of uh, contact lens manufacturer, my contact lens fitter, my optometrist, myself, and we, we huddled together and we created a plateau-shaped lens called the Quintosphere lens. It was a five curve lens and it simulated reverse geometry. Uh, then now remember this is before we had the ability to um, uh, carve lenses um, by computers. So uh, we were able to do this and we were able to uh, fit this to corneal transplant patients. And I felt, and many others did, that this lens was an excellent alternative for penetrating graphs. But in addition, we thought we could mold an RK patient. If you look at the shape of an RK, it's kind of a plateau shape, and we thought we could kind of fit it. And we, we started with under-corrected RK patients who didn't achieve the full correction. And we were able to press them down with this lens, mold them down. You're talking around 1995 or so. And I published a few papers in the uh, Clayo Journal on this. So there was my interest. Yeah. So Bruce, um, this, this, this evolution of kind of, kind of being a contact lens guy, um, you know, isn't a really a common place for a lot of ophthalmologists. It was far more common back in the nineties than it seems to be today. And you kind of started getting into orthokeratology and so forth. Where, where in this mix did you start saying, Hey, contact lenses for kids and maybe we can be slowing down the progression of myopia. How did that evolution take place for you? Well, I was lucky enough to be invited to participate in what was called the SMART study. SMART study was the stabilization of myopia through accelerated refractive therapy. And there are two researchers up in Chicago, Barry Iden was one, and uh, they selected out eight sites two of which were ophthalmology sites and the other six optometry sites. And I was one of those sites. And we were started to fit um, ortho-K lens versus a traditional soft contact lens in children from the ages of eight to 14. And 
Mm. And I found out that the kids actually enjoyed uh, these lenses because they saw the effect um, in being able to see better. And the SMART study did was published years later, and it did show a, a statistically significant improvement every year, year one, two, and three, and it was a three-year study. So that got me fitting kits. Yeah. I think in that in that study, correct me if I'm wrong, it was less than a quarter of a diopter for the ortho K group. And there was about a diopter and a quarter of change in the single vision group, certainly showing over a two, three year period that there was a substantial improvement. And that was not maybe not the pivotal, but one of the pivotal studies that we look back on and say, hey, that is a great. So that kind of got your your uh, your juice is flowing and saying, hey, this is this is something to think about. So it, at, at any point in your career, did you start to see some shifts in starting to treat more children or has it was it pri- pr- primarily an orthokeratology thing with adults for you in your practice? Well, it shifted when we finished the SMART study because, you know, <laughs> it proved to us that uh, see, science sometimes works and um, the participants. <laughs> Times is advantageous. And so we weren't afraid anymore. And, you know, the messages started to get out from the kids that were in the SMART study. They would be telling uh, their uh, comrades, you know, at the swimming pool and other things. And we would market, um, uh, you know, in the newspaper at that time. And we would support uh, swim meets and basketball teams and, yeah. you know, some of those things that, uh, uh, my my good friend uh, Dr. D would teach me about in terms of marketing. That's right, and all still good ideas to do, particularly in that swimming world for sure. Bruce, I wanna I wanna pivot here, and I wanna talk uh, in general terms, not just from you, but let's talk a little bit about your ophthalmology colleagues and yes. how how his historically. From an ophthalmologist perspective, I can tell you how I perceive it to be from an optometrist perspective. How has myopia management and orthokeratology historically been seen um, up until 2000, 2010 by ophthalmologists, right? You're, you're kind of this, this, this different being in that you've embraced it and brought it in. But from my perception, both of those things historically have been somewhat papooed by the vast majority of ophthalmologists, right? And there's some people like there's some people that have embraced it. And for that matter, a lot of a lot of it's been papooed by optometrists as too. But share with us a little bit about that uh, that exposure in the ophthalmology world as a whole. Well, the good news in a quick summary is things have changed to the positive direction. Yeah. Initially, you, you have to understand that ophthalmologists see the, the worst ulcers. We see the Friday right. afternoon ulcers, you know, they've been treated all week long and they're just going downhill. And, you know, we saw the articles coming out of uh, China um, in, the, uh, in 2005 and six, where there were some terrible infections and some other, some other areas, even the United States, only with the canthamoeba and pseudomonas. And, Ophthalmologists don't like that, you know, and, no. and it was easy for them to jump on the negative bandwagon. Mm. And general ophthalmologists, I think optometrists as well, we we're, we're tend to be conservative people. It's like, show me first before, you know, I'm going to jump in and do something, you know, a little avant-garde. Um, but time went on. And what happened, I think, best is the scientific uh, research, you know, starting with Pauline Cho's work. Moving on, Jeff Walleen, reduplicating it in the United States. You know, moving on to <clears throat> um, uh, Santo Domingo's work in, in Spain and Japan, uh, Kiriaka's uh, papers in five-year study and now 10-year study, maybe even 15-year study now. Um, excellent papers getting into the toughest ophthalmology journals that, in, in the investigative ophthalmology journal from Arvo. Mm-hmm. Um, they published. And they all showed good results with not terrible infections. Yeah. And, you know, when I would talk and I would talk extensively, I, um, I made a point to, to say that under good compliance and teaching and good follow-up care, I had no infections, no corneal ulcers over a 20-year period with my ortho-K 
uh, patients, and that includes the children. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. you can say that from the heart, and you know, and actually be publishing it. Um, you know, I think it's impressive. So ophthalmology has listened. We have yeah. given we PLEO organizations give a number of symposia on this issue. Probably for the last ten years, we've had written symposia in our journal, <clears throat> special symposia myopia. You know, we're trying to kind of introduce that to the general ophthalmology public, uh, excuse me, profession. And it is slowly working. About five years ago, I was invited to speak on orthokeratology to the Pediatric Ophthalmology Subspecialty Day. There must have been 500, 600 pediatric ophthalmologists in their special day prior to our academy meeting. And here I am giving a 30 to 45 minute lecture on the, on the pros of orthokeratology. And so many of them came up to me afterwards and said, that's unbelievable. You know, we, mm-hmm. we didn't know, we don't know. And so it's really, we have to educate our ophthalmologists. We have to show them the literature over and over and over again. We have to show them some of our patients um, and make them believers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful. Like you said, it, uh, it, 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 it's having a turn, right? And I think that's starting to happen in optometry even more too. You know, we have to take a step back and say, as an optometrist, we have not embraced orthokeratology. We have not embraced myopia management and, uh, and, but we're getting to do that more and more. I think some of the concern was when a, uh, a, somebody had gone through a ophthalmology, uh, you know, rotation or something, and they heard bad things about ortho K and myopia, and then they shared that with their patients and their patient came in and said, no, I don't want anything to do with that. But that's really churning and and changing. And one thing I want to bring up to us as listeners is the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus put out a myopia consensus statement in 2023 where they reviewed in uh, over the course of seven pages uh, of why myopia management is a problem, why undercorrection doesn't work, pinhole glasses don't work, bifocal glasses. They reviewed everything that's out there and they came to a conclusion that the risk of doing treatment is so much smaller than the risk of not treating a patient. And so it we have to intervene on this myopia concept and it's because of ophthalmologists like you, Bruce, who have continued to drive this science. And as you said, show me, right? We have to show our colleagues how these things are working. And it's, it's really exciting. Where do you see, Bruce, the world of ophthalmology changing in the next five years as myopia management continues to explode? How do you, how do you foresee um, the, the world of ophthalmology embracing this? Do you think it's going to be something they'll, they'll push down to optometrists like a, a lot of refractions have been done? Or do you think there's going to be a lot of embracing it and fitting kids in their offices? How do you kind of see things changing in the next five years? Well, I think that, you know, we have to work together as I team. Um, as groups. And at one point in time, um, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, you know, in doing surveys of um, who the ophthalmologists were working with, they, it came up that 40% of the ophthalmologists were working with optometrists, 40%. Mm-hmm. Now, that may mean that, you know, you've got a big group, you've got 10 retina people, and you've got three optometrists in the big group. But it, so it may be weighed a little bit more. But I think that if we're going to make this work, we have got to see kids, right? And ophthalmologists yeah. don't see kids in general. Um, I uh, I had a rule that I didn't uh, see any child unless it was a cornea problem under the age of five. Um, maybe I didn't like the screaming. Maybe I didn't like the messy waiting room. I, I'm not quite <laughs> sure about the norm. Um, you know what I'm saying. So we generally... Um, just stick to older patients and, you know, cataract surgery. And um, so if we're going to make this work, we got to make it with the pediatric ophthalmologist and pediatric ophthalmologists need to work with uh, some really talented optometrists. And 
We need then the corporations, David, to help us. And that what the exciting news is that some of the smaller companies now been bought over, if you will, by bigger companies. And now we've got, you know, the Johnson and Johnsons of the world. We've got the Bausch and Loans. We've got the um, Cooper Vision. You know, we've got some substantial companies that are putting um, a little backbone financially behind some of these educational initiatives. Once we start educating the public and they start demanding, I want my kid to have this done, um, it's going to change the whole emphasis of what yeah. we do. I, and I, I think agree. there's a lot here, David. I think that, you know, you need to keep up with literature, no matter who you are in the profession, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's proven and you don't offer it, you're going to get stung at some point in time. You may yeah. offer it by sending it somewhere else, you know, saying, well, I have a friend who's a great pediatric ophthalmologist or ophthalmologist who's doing contact lenses in this area and, and atropine and, and it has a great myopia program. But you need to do something. And when the glasses come out, myopic glasses, wow, that's, that's a game changer. So, you know, I think we have bright horizon for both of our professions and we need to, we're the people who need to move them in the right direction. Yeah. And move them, move them together. Right. And that's, uh, that's why I love working with you, Bruce, is that collaborative nature. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Any closing remarks uh, that you want to make that we haven't touched on so far, Bruce? Um, I think that um, uh, just to mention international, yeah. some of us, you know, travel and like to know what's going on. Um, there's a resurgence of, Orthokeratology and myopia management in Brazil. Mm. Uh, previously, they had bad experiences with the older orthoke lenses, and now they are re rejuvenated. Um, I've been to China um, on a numerous occasions, and they're doing, in, in conjunction with the government, they're doing some marvelous things with myopic control in, in China. And we're not, we're not hearing anymore about those bad cases of infections um, you know, and non-instruction and non-compliance uh, like we did. Europe used to not talk about ortho -K, like in France. Now they're having special meetings in myopia management. I mean, I could go on and on, but, you know, it's ex we live in exciting times right now. And uh, uh, let us all get behind the, the same bandwagon. And let's take Absolutely. care, as, as a friend, Gary Hertzberg says, let's go take care of those kids and let's, yeah. let's not make as, as they might might be if we didn't intervene yeah well that's awesome i sure appreciate your time thanks for joining me on the the podcast it's been it's been fun thanks for having me yeah absolutely and thank you for joining us for this episode make sure to like subscribe do me a big favor and share this episode with a friend and uh, stay tuned next time for another great episode of the myopia podcast One, two, three, thank you for tuning in to the myopia podcast if you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.